Hi, welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. It's Blackout Week here on the Power Hungry Podcast. I am the host, Robert Bryce. We talk about energy, power, innovation, and politics. And today it's blackouts, blackouts, blackouts. Um, and I'm pleased to welcome my friend, uh, Steve Brick, who is in Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, he is a independent power consultant with four decades of experience in the power business. Uh, Steve, I've given you a brief intro. Uh, I, I, I warned you, I have all of our guests introduce themselves. So if you have given you the brief intro, do you mind just giving us a little bit more about you and yours and say, imagine you just arrived at a dinner party, you don't know anyone and you're asked to introduce yourself. Go. I'll, I'll tell you my life story in 45 seconds, Robert. <laughs> um, I, th I think I've told you this before, but um, uh, I went to college to be an ornithologist. I was a biology major, and when I was a sophomore in 1973, I got hired to work on an environmental impact study that was going on just north of Madison here, where 2,000 megawatt coal-fired power plants were being built. And I was out there counting birds and insects and identifying plants, but I got absolutely fascinated by this massive construction project that was going on. And I worked on that project all four years that I was an undergraduate. And the more I learned about what being an academic ornithologist was all about, and the more fascinated I got with the interaction between energy and human systems, I went, I wanna do something that's a little more practical than becoming an academic ornithologist. So I graduated from the university, went off to work for a few years, came back and did a graduate program in energy studies where I, uh, beefed up on my uh, engineering and some of the technical things that I didn't have as an undergraduate. And since that time, I've, I've worked in every corner of the power industry. I've worked in a public utility regulatory agency. I've worked in the nonprofit center. I've worked for an independent power company, I've worked for a foundation. I've come at this problem from every imaginable corner. And uh, here I am now, four decades in, and I'm still absolutely fascinated by it. And, and like you, Robert, I'm passionately convinced that there is nothing more essential to modern life than electricity. And so the opportunity to talk with you during Blackout Week and uh, is, is just, it, I'm just been really looking forward to this. <laughs> well, thank you. I have to add that you, Steve, are have the first word and the last word in our documentary, Juice, How Electricity Explains the World. So uh, uh, here you are uh, back again. I'm drafting you again for another highly paid uh, starring <laughs> role in another another project. Uh, but let's just jump in. And, and I know you've you've continued your love of birds because we talk about birds and I, I saw a habit hermit thrush in our yard during the snowstorms. It seems to be have, have left now, but nevertheless, yeah, yeah. We, we won't talk birds too much here instead. So we spoke yesterday on the phone about what's going on in Texas. And you told me uh, we started talking about reserve margin. Now, there are many reasons why Texas grid went to the verge of failure and that we had millions of people blacked out. But one of the key reasons that we talked about yesterday is the issue of reserve margin. What is reserve margin and why does it matter in Texas or in other grids? Why do grid operators care about reserve margin? Sure. Well, reserve margin is simply that extra increment of power that you have above and beyond your expected demand to step in when inevitable failures happen on the, on the grid. We always plan the grid for failures, right? We expect there's gonna be an outage at a power plant. We expect that there will be the occasional outage of a transmission line. We want the grid to continue to work around those outages. So the reserve margin is simply the amount of generating capacity that we build into the system above and beyond the demand that we expect to, 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 to step in in those emergencies. Round numbers around the United States, around the world, 20% is a, is a typical number for a reserve margin. So if you have a demand on a system that was a thousand megawatts, you'd build a system of 1200 megawatts to, to cover those kinds of emergencies, those kinds of outages. Um, and uh, so one of, the, one of the things about reserve margin 
is that the larger the footprint you're operating in as a grid, the better able you are to share reserves with your neighbors. So remember, the, 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 the United States is, is three big grids, right? We've got the Eastern Interconnect, we've got the Western Interconnect, and we've got Texas. And, you, you know, say, you say that with just a slight hint of derision, which has become common lately, but this, and then we have Texas. You know, I'm from, you know, I'm from Oklahoma, right? So I, I know I haven't, drink, I, I've been, I haven't been drinking the Kool-Aid about Texas, right? But I, I, I know, but I'll, I'll tell you, I'm, 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 I'm actually, I'm a fan of Texas. I've enjoyed every trip I've made to Texas and, and I'm not, I'm not an anti-Texas guy in any way, but Texas made some policy decisions way back in the 1970s about how they were or weren't going to be integrated with the rest of the country. And the decisions that they made meant that Texas stands alone when it comes to providing for its reliability. Whereas here in Wisconsin, where I live, um, we're part of a pool that effectively encompasses the whole Eastern United States from the, from the, from the center of the country all the way to the East Coast. And so when we, can, we can share reserves and we can make reliability decisions across a very broad footprint like that. And, and the Western United States does the same thing. So Texas- Because, has, they, because they have those interconnects. But I just wanna interrupt here because I've heard a lot about this. And I, you know, I, we, during the filming of Juice and in my own travels and in talking with other people on the podcast, including Brad Rockwell at Kauai Island Utility Cooperative, Island grids are common all over the world. Sure. Iceland has one, you know, so, I mean, it, it, let me ask the question then and just interrupt here. Yes, so effectively Texas has an island grid. It's a big island and it's not actually an island. It's not, but it, it, is that really the problem or, could, or was this just really a problem of engineering? Because island no. grids work all over the world. Yeah, that's right. No, that's not the problem. What it means is that relatively speaking, Texas probably should have, I would say, from an engineering standpoint, Texas would probably want to have slightly higher reserves because of its island nature, right? Now, the, the and instead of having higher reserves, it had lower reserves. And 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 again, one of the one of the the big challenges, and we talked about this yesterday, Robert, and we've talked about it before. Texas has a market structure that does not lend itself to the kind of reliability planning that we can do in other places around the country where we don't have the same kind of market structure. So here in Wisconsin, good old fashioned, you know, cheesehead conservatism, um, we didn't deregulate our power markets. And so we've got a kind of a good old fashioned system where the utilities are uh, regulated monopolies and where they are assured through what is sometimes called the regulatory compact uh, that they will be able to get their money back for any reasonable investment. And those reasonable investments have always included investments in reliability. And in fact, historically, regulators have always liked just a little more investment in reliability because nobody likes to have blackouts. Nobody likes to have power outages. So just, so just to interrupt, but the, the idea of the integrated utility, and correct me if I'm wrong, that means you have one company, they own the generation, they own the, and they own the wires and they own the meter that's a, that is, and you have one chain of command throughout. That's right, that's right. But we don't, we, well, I live in Austin, it's kind of a mix of those, but we don't, we've disaggregated the, the system. So we have wires right. companies and generators only, and this is a, a much more complex system to, to manage, is that fair? That's, that's absolutely fair. The generators in Texas, play as purely competitive actors. There's no regulatory guarantee that any of them are gonna get their money back through the power markets. Um, so that's, that's very, very different. And one of the things I would argue that we've found, uh, if we look around the United States, the, the places that have moved most aggressively toward deregulated markets are coincidentally the places that have had the most reliability problems in recent times. California moved very early and very aggressively to deregulate its power markets. And, and the, the, the reliability problems that they've had over the past several years have been well publicized. New England moved very aggressively 
to deregulate power markets in New England. And several winters ago, they had similar kinds of problems with gas supply and had outages because their regulatory markets don't do a good job, uh, don't do as good a job of delivering reliability as kind of traditional markets do. And now we have Texas. And Texas, in some sense, may have the most kind of um, pure market kind of system uh, that uh, you know, they have what's called an energy only market. Um, and so one of the things that, that it's, it's unlikely, you, you just don't see companies making massive investments in the kind of thermal power plants that you need to maintain reliability uh, if there's not a guarantee that they're gonna get their money back. This is an asset that's very expensive, billions of dollars of investment. And if they got a bet on, on getting it back from the market, they're not very likely gonna, gonna, gonna dive in there. Well, I think that's the key point that I, I keep coming, I keep hearing over and over. And, and uh, just a, a reminder to all of you listening, I'm talking to Steve Brick, uh, my, my good friend. He's an independent power consultant, has 40 years of experience in the electric power business. He doesn't have a podcast, a book, a film. A, no, he's, I think you told me you want to recommend that people look at Meredith Angwin's new book, uh, uh, Shorting the Grid, which I think I've probably sold more copies of Meredith's book than I've sold of mine, but that's okay. She's, she's maybe her book is better, <laughs> certainly right on point right now. Yeah. yeah. But, but, the, but she made the point in, in, and I wrote, I had a, I published a piece in Forbes uh, just a, a, a little bit ago talking about her, her point was, which was this was the, the failure in Texas was a case of grid mismanagement that the, the system was not set up to reward resilience and reliability. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah, and 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 again, what I would what I would say is that um, you know I've noticed that ERCOT, the uh, Electric Reliability Council of Texas, has been taking a lot of heat. Um, I would yeah, say well, you saw that the three or four board members resigned just today. I didn't see that. No, the chairman, the chairman resigned. Uh, the two of the board, two or three of the board members. I did, I don't know who they were. There were several out of state board members who were catching all kinds of hell because they don't live in Texas. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I can but, kind of understand that too. And, and again, I don't. I you know, there's a lot that's going to emerge about this this event in the next. I would say in the next twelve to eighteen months. And a lot of the stuff that I hear, you know, being proclaimed confidently on CNN or <coughs> any of these other sort of news outlets, I'm kind of going, we don't really have the information to make that kind of a strong declaration. ERCOT, um, I, I don't, I, I think, and again, you and I were talking about this earlier, I think in the, in, at the end of the day, if we're, if we're sober and we look at the, the, the sort of root causes and the chain of events that, that led to the outages in Texas, there'll be plenty of blame to go around. And, um, you know, ERCOT, doesn't get to make up the rules. It isn't like ERCOT said, oh, let's have, a, let's have an unreliable system. ERCOT has to manage the system according to the rules that the Texas legislature and the Railroad Commission, uh, who, are, who jointly kind of set the, 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 the rules for deregulation in Texas, uh, ERCOT has to implement those rules. So and, just, to, just to interrupt, was the, uh, the Railroad Commission regulates oil and gas. Are you sure you're not talking about the Public Utility Commission? I mean the Public Utility. Okay. Back in the day, by the way, back in the day, the Railroad Commission regulated everything. Okay, yeah. And, and I'm still in that habit of calling it, calling it the Railroad Commission because no, I- No, no, you know, no problem. I, I'm, 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 you know, I, have, I have an old brain. No, no worry. So you're, so you're, and I think that that's a key point is that, and you know, there's going to be a lot of heat on all the people at, at, at ERCOT, but they are the regional, they're the RTO, the regional transmission operator. They're, they are the ones who oversee the market, but they didn't create the rules. They're implementing the rules. And, and, you know, and I know, um, I don't know a lot of people at ERCOT, but I know the kind of people that work at places like ERCOT. They're, they're many, many of them are electrical engineers. And what I can tell you about elect electrical engineers from a reliability standpoint is if the world is up to them, they would build the system with belt, suspenders, gray tape, and, and staples. You know, they, they want, they want, they left of the engineers would have five redundancies. Um, and so, again, a lot of these kind of tendencies that deregulation has forced into the system are kind of very anti traditional engineering caution. 
Well, and so why was that? I mean, you know, it's been funny for me to watch it. Um, and, and let me ask this question first. I, I want to come back to this idea about the uh, about how, why this market was created the way it was, but I've been stunned, frankly, and I'm a longtime critic of the wind business, you know, proudly so. I, you know, they, they, I, I, I've talked to a lot of people who've left their homes because of noise from wind turbines. There are a lot of external issues that they don't deal with. There, I'll cut to the point or the question. There were a flood of stories in the immediate aftermath of the blackout saying it's not wind's fault. How much of the, the, the I know there's not a single fault, a single cause of why these blackouts happened, but how much blame does the wind industry deserve in this blackout situation? Yeah, I would say it's, uh, it, it has been much overstated in the press. Um, ERCOT does a very good job of kind of estimating the reliability value of wind and the reliability value that ERCOT assigns to wind is quite low. In the, and single, that, in the single digits of capacity, right? It's in the single digits of capacity and particularly because Texas has so much wind that as you, you know, the first increment of wind that you build may have a, a kind of a 20% capacity value, but that falls off very steeply as you add more and more and more wind, because of course, the wind production is highly correlated, really, you know, in, in the West Texas area, it's highly coordinated, uh, highly um, correlated. And um, so- Correlated with, I'm sorry, what? With, with, with weather, right? I so yeah. when, 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 when the wind is blowing, all the wind in West Texas is producing a lot. When the wind isn't blowing, none of it's producing. So your, your marginal capacity value goes down very, very quickly. And, 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 just, and, and just to make <laughs> that capacity value, because I want to make clear to people who aren't familiar with these terms, because yep. there are a lot of terms. There's a, there's a big vocabulary in the electric sector. But the, the capacity value, I think there's about 30,000 megawatts of capacity, wind capacity in Texas. But the ERCOT, I don't know, know these numbers right off the top of my head, but I think it was less than 10%. They were counting something like it was 2,000, 3,000 megawatts yeah. as being available during extreme winter weather. Is that, I, I, the memory serves, is that about right? Yeah, that's, that, that, that sounds about right. And um, so uh, that, But for a nuclear plant, uh, that, you know, like the South Texas project, which is roughly 2000 megawatts, they would be counting roughly 2000 megawatts or yeah, something, they, they, something they, very close to the maximum. They would count most of it. Yep. And depending, you know, depending upon the circumstances and the time of year, they'd count all of it. Okay. So uh, back to the question. So I, I, I've sidetracked a little bit, but so how much is it right? Is it fair to blame wind to show that, that to make the point that wind bears should shoulder a significant part of the blame is that is what yeah you, no i don't i i would say that's not fair i would say ERCOT credits wind appropriately for uh you know they understand that it's a resource that's variable you can't count on it when it produces energy it's great because the energy is cheap but you better be prepared to step in when the wind doesn't blow and when the wind turbines don't operate um so uh you know, is there some blame? Yes, probably some blame. Um, but I would say the the stories that have said wind was singularly responsible for the outages in Texas are simply untrue. And we do have we do have some examples globally, Robert, you and I've talked about this, where there were outages in very unique situations in South Australia, for example, where uh, there there was an outage where, you know, you can pretty well, you can pretty well sort of sort out the, the, the causes of that outage and wind played a very, very major role or the unavailability of wind played a very major role in, in what was a, effectively a statewide blackout in South Australia. And that's not the, that's not the case here. Um, Texas, you know, wind isn't great in the winter in Texas. People weren't counting on the wind at this point. And uh, it, it, was, it was just a variety of other, other factors that, that clearly came into play. Um, so, so if I can interrupt, because I, it was a point that I made in the piece that I just published on, on Forbes about this, which was that the estimates by Texas Public Policy Foundation, which is a conservative think tank here in Austin, they estimated that something like $36 billion will be spent on Texas wind between 2006, 2029. It was a big number. Yeah. And so 
my reaction to that was, well, if the state and federal taxpayers are paying that much to to deploy wind in Texas, well, if it's not available during times when the ver the grid is on the verge of collapse, why are we spending so much money on it? I mean, is that a fair point? Yeah, it's a perfectly fair point. And I, you know, I think I can give you my version of an answer to that question. Please do. Well, um, as I like to say, wind and solar are the charismatic megafauna of the energy ecosystem. <laughs> These are the, the lions and the tigers and the bears and the elephants. The panda. They're the pandas. <laughs> the pan <laughs> you know, I mean, everybody, you know, everybody loves renewable. Everybody loves you know, but nobody ever stood back and said, you know, people said, what are we going to pay for this stuff? But nobody really ever asked the question, well, what is the value that wind and solar contribute to the system? And if we're going to pay something for them, and I think it's absolutely fair that we pay something for them, what we pay should be somehow related to the value that they give the system. The resilience and reliability value. Well, I don't think they give much in terms of resilience and reliability. What they do is they give us a source of cheap energy, but almost no capacity. Well, if we were going to, if we were going to just pay them on their energy value, which is, you know, I think I could make a case that uh, we'd start there. Maybe we'd give them a little, you know, kind of kicker for the fact that they don't emit any pollutants. Um, but I believe that that would add up to far less on a on a dollar per megawatt hour basis than 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 these resources are being paid. I think we uh, routinely overpay for wind and solar. We pay much more than they're worth as a system resource. And in fact, I mean the so other thing not, when you say pay, are you saying that we're subsidizing them too heavily? Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so you know, I'm I'm going to give you. So, uh, who are you working for? Why are you saying this? Well, you know, it, this is the immediate response when there's any, and this was the immediate response from all you know, all these journalists, none of whom live in Texas. Well, most of whom don't live in Texas. Oh well, you know, it's the fossil fuel industry has captured Greg Abbott and all these other critics of the wind business in Texas. They wouldn't be saying this otherwise. Yeah, I mean, you know, I. Um... I, I don't have any connection to the wind industry, although I've actually done, you know, in, in years past, I did a consulting project for OEA, for the American Wind Energy Association. Um, I don't have a dog in the hunt, um, but to me, it's a matter of just kind of raw power system economics that if you want to have a rational system, if you want to have a rational grid, you pay the resources that are on that grid something that relates to the value that they contribute to the grid. And those values are things like capacity and capacity. Think of capacity as the horsepower in your car. You don't use all the horsepower all the time, but if you want to pass somebody, you know, in a, in a dodgy situation, you're really glad you've got the horsepower to do it. You've got the energy that comes out, which are the kilowatt hours. Um, you've got a whole range of sort of reliability related attributes. We talked about reserve margin. Within that broad category of reserves, there are, you know, five or six or seven different types of reserve that the that the grid typically wants to have. And um, some resources, you know, a, a, a natural gas plant, um, a nuclear plant, plants that are more traditionally thermal that have rotating inertia, they can provide those reliability resources, whereas some of the other resources that are more variable, like wind, like solar, um, it's more difficult for them to provide those resources. And in some cases, they don't provide those resources at all. So you pay, you pay, you should pay the resource what it gives the grid, not pay the resource because it's, it's the panda of the energy system and you think it's cute. Um, and, and well, so let me, let me interrupt because I, I, this is a point that I want to get to because I, I was on a panel or I, I moderated a panel a few years ago with Bill Magnus at ERCOT and the issue of grid inertia came up. What is grid inertia? So the grid, um, you know, this is a fun fact that everybody should know. Here's, here's my takeaway for the program, Robert, everybody needs to remember this. There'll be a test. Well, I'm next still week. stuck on pandas. So if you're going to throw in some more, you know, more golden gems here, I'm going to but go so, ahead. So the grid is one 
single interconnected machine. So let's just talk about taxis. All of the generators that are connected to the grid and all of the devices that are connected to the grid that use electricity operate together in synchrony. They're a single machine. And because back in the day, Westinghouse won and Edison lost, we have what's called an alternating current system. And alternating- Edison wanted a direct current, DC. Ed Edison and, wanted direct current. And, and, and Westinghouse proved that AC was much more effective, particularly over long distance and moved the electricity from Buffalo, from Niagara Falls into the city of Buffalo. And that that, was, right. the, that was the key experiment in 1893, something like that. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm bad on those dates, but a, you know, a while ago. Um, so that what that means is that our system operates uh, at a particular frequency. In the United States, we operate a system at 60 hertz, meaning that alternating current alternates back and forth uh, 60 times per second. And um, the most important thing about keeping the grid stable is that you have to keep grid frequency within about a half a cycle, either up or down of that 60 Hertz. So 60.4, 59.6, everything is fine. 60.7, things start getting dodgy. 59.2, things start getting dodgy. That's an enormously tight sort of range within which we have to operate the system. And what's amazing is if you think about that system as, as sort of oscillating back and forth, that oscillation is provided on the generation side by lots and lots and lots of very large rotors that are mostly rotating at 3,600 revolutions per minute. And when you turn on your light at home, the system slows down just a little bit. And someplace, a generator senses that and increases its output a little bit and speeds the system back up so it stays within that 59.5 to 60.5 hertz range. And, and just to be clear, so what, when you flip on your air conditioner or your refrigerator and you see the lights dim just a little bit, that that's a change in voltage, which that's changes the, that changes the frequency. And that that's frequency has to run within that very narrow margin. Okay, so... And voltage, just to remind people, that's akin to water pressure in a pipe. That that that's is the exactly. amount, of, amount of pressure that has to be kept in that pipe and that needs to be, you know, be kept at a very steady state. So back to grid inertia. Back to grid inertia. So we have lots and lots of power plants that have generators that spin at 3,600 RPM. And that's the inertia in the system. And if you, for example, cut the power plant off, that rotor will continue to rotate because there is so much energy sort of contained uh, there, so much inertial energy, it will continue to rotate for quite a while. So it's that kinetic energy that has been, been created through the steam going through the turb, the, the, the generators that spin that, that, that steel. That spin the rotor that, that create the inertia on the system. And the more inertia you have, the more you're able to respond to swings. So when I and, turn, I could turn on a lot of lights and it's not gonna change the frequency. And, that, and, and again, that happens, you know, that happens all the time, right? You've got a, um, you've got a, a, a large factory, for example, and they have a process and, you know, it's possible that they can just bring that process on almost instantaneously. And that can, you know, you'll hear a large sucking sound on the grid when that happens. And the reason that the grid doesn't crash when that happens is because we've got sufficient inertia committed, sufficient ability to ramp up and meet that demand even under, under very, very sort of short terms. So, you know, when bad things happen on the grid, very often it is because we fail to maintain system frequency. So the 2004 blackout in the Northeast, uh, you know, it all started, I mean, now we know a lot about root causes of that 2004 blackout, right? There was a, there was a, a, a high voltage transmission line that sort of tangled with some vegetation and that started a chain of events. 
But effectively, at some point in that event, frequency started to become unstable. It started to go outside of that safe range. When that happens, the reason that's a concern, it's a concern for a lot of reasons, but the biggest reason it's a concern is um, power plants, which are obviously very large and very expensive, can be damaged if they're attempting to send 60 cycle power out into a grid that is somehow or other oscillating wildly away from 60 cycles. So what the way the way they work is if the if the sensors in a power plant detect that the system is that frequency is not stable, they desynchronize the power plant because they would rather protect the power plant and uh, and and create a, a sort of a, a localized reliability problem than attempt to override that frequency instability. And that's the ride through capability. Is that what, uh, is that right? What is that yeah. the right term? Yeah, so, I mean it. So, so let me let me get back to the point why, why I think this, this matters is that there was a, a lot of reporting around Bill Magnus saying that frequency fell to 59.93. I talked to an ERCOT engineer yesterday who told me it actually fell to 59.3. It, Remember, it, that's below the 59.5 that I talked about. Right. So 59.93 would not be a problem. 59.3 is a problem. And so what happens if it falls below 59? What would it, I guess, let me ask this question because I, I referred to it today, but how close did Texas come to a complete grid meltdown? Pretty close. I mean, and we've heard that and, from- And a, what would that have looked like? Well, what it would have looked like is- uh, you know, what I would say it would have looked like is as system frequency, and in this case, system frequency was falling, because you said it was 59.3, right? That's, that's, that's two tenths of a hertz below that safe 59.5 level that I talked about. As power plants detected that, they would attempt to do what they could to bring frequency back up. But if all the power plants are already dispatched fully, nobody's going to be able to do anything to bring the frequency back up. And as that signal persists, power plants are going to desynchronize. They're going to cut themselves off from the grid. And then that's just, that, that can just become a daisy chain where everything in the control area cuts itself off. Now, the problem with Texas is Texas is the control area. So it, and, so, it's very easy. And, and so then that would take us if they all cut off that takes us to what's called black start is that right yeah, then everything goes everything goes dark there's no electricity on the entire grid that's available and you and have has, to, has to be restarted from the beginning and then in a grid like this where we have 70 at peak 70,000 megawatts 70 gigawatts of demand how long would that take well it you know it can take you know i'm in 2004 in the northeast um, it took 48 hours to get everything back up and running, you know, because again, you start plant by plant, area by area. So, so, so power plants to synchronize with each other to get them back in yeah. all in synchronicity that, that then that synchronicity has to grow from plant to plant as they're brought on and matched with demand. Yeah. And and here's another great example of things that, that, purely competitive markets don't, don't necessarily capture very well. Not every plant has black start capability. See, I, did, I didn't know that, but yeah. well, let, me just, let me just finish this question about black start because I was doing some fair amount of speculation, honestly, in the, in the piece that I wrote. But if, we, if Texas did go to black start and you're at a point where you're sub-freezing temperatures, there's in the single digits when, in, on the night of the 14th, early morning of the 15th, yeah. And you have <laughs> snow falling, the roads are impassable. Um, there's, it's not just snowing in some places, it's freezing rain. And what then if you go to, to the, the grid goes to black start, then all your nursing homes, hospitals, fire stations, police stations, all are suddenly in the dark. Yeah. I mean, you know, one thing, one thing to recognize, um, large nursing homes, hospitals, a lot of public buildings, have emergency generation. Right. They're going to have a diesel generator that is going to detect the fact that the grid has just gone on vacation. Right. And that diesel generator, 
<laughs> and they didn't have they didn't have vacation leave on the schedule. Yeah, this was this is unplanned leave, right? <laughs> so 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 for, for for really sensitive places of infrastructure, you know, it's hard to imagine a hospital these days that doesn't have an emergency generator. Now you can't, you know, that emergency generator isn't typically sized so you just kind of like go on with what you were doing, right? You're gonna you're gonna you're gonna be reducing operations to absolute minimal levels. Sure. And a, a lot of the larger um, assisted care facilities, my mom and dad live in a place uh, not very far from where I live. Um, they've got an emergency generator uh, with that facility. You know, emergency generators are actually kind of cheap. And one of the things I'm going to want to watch is um, I'm going to be interested to see how the sales of emergency generators go in Texas now that this has happened. Oh yeah, well, I mean, I I, I, just, I I referenced a piece today that that uh, Generac. In fact, it's a Wisconsin company. I believe. Yeah, 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 yeah. They, Buy they it. Said, they said their demand is out through the roof. They can't keep up with demand. Everybody wants one. So, well, let me let me get back to. It. So, I appreciate that the the discourse on the on the reliability thing. I want to uh, there. I want to go back to this idea of reliability and renewables. Mm -hmm. and so is is. is why are we seeing more blackouts? Is it we're seeing that we saw them in, in, in is it is it just a, a function of this effort to deregulate the power market? And and should we is it a mistake? Was deregulation a mistake? Well, let me answer let me answer that that last question first, Robert. Way back in the 90s, when we started talking about deregulating our power markets. Um, I was doing work for a, a New England NGO uh, that was very much involved in kind of trying to shape utility policy. And we took a look at, you know, how the regulatory system was working and then said, well, we can't do any worse under deregulation. And we tried to then have some conversations about what rational deregulation would look like. Now, that was more than 20 years ago. Um, I would say that starting in the early 2000s, as I looked at the impacts that deregulated power markets have had in the United States and in Europe and elsewhere, I started to have a lot of buyer's regret. And I started to rethink uh, my kind of earlier positions on deregulation. And I, you know, I, I, I don't think you know, I have never seen any convincing sort of empirical analysis that's, that, that, that demonstrates benefits of deregulation to U.S. customers. You know, amongst economists, it's just accepted as a matter of faith, right? It's, 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 it's creedal. Yes, markets are better. Therefore, people are better off. I'm not so sure because, again, um, uh, if I can interrupt, because I think it's a critical point, and it's one that I've thought about a fair amount. I, it, years ago, I heard a guy who was the head of WAPA, the Western Area Power Association, Western Area Power Administration. It's a big government entity that manages power in the in the Western states, and he made a point then that I hadn't really thought about. He said, "We've got this whole electricity business wrong. We're selling watt hours. We're selling a commodity. We're really selling a service." And that to me is interesting because it changes, if you think about it as a service, it changes the idea about what it is the business model should be, right? You're not selling widgets, you're selling a life-saving uh, supply of the ability to do work and that is central to everything we do. And so is that a fair, I mean, how do you, how do you I, 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 I'm, follow, I'm trying to follow on your point about deregulation and whether it's been a benefit but if we saw the, the electricity business as more of a service instead of the watt hour commodity business, which is what it turned into in Texas, would that have fundamentally changed how the market worked? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 my problem is I'm not sure I like the term service. Um, it's, it, 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 it feels like it understates the importance of electricity to me somehow. Give me, you know, give me, a, better, give me a better word. I, I'm, I'm not coming up with it, but, but I mean, Honestly, Robert, you know, one of the things that, that I've become so passionate about the older I've gotten is that in terms of just kind of keeping modern society running, there is nothing more essential than electricity, full stop. 
Now, if that's a service, well, that's fine. We'll call it a service, but it feels like it's more than that. I mean, and this is this is why I, you know, it's like I, I, I do a lot of teaching and I always start my classes because my classes always have to do with energy and always have to do with electricity. And I always say, all right, think of one thing in your life that you do that doesn't involve electricity. And it's always dead silence, right? And somebody will go, well, you know, I flush the toilet. And it's like, well, how do you think that water got from the sewage treatment, from the, from the water treatment plant to you? And how do you think it's gonna get back there? So yeah, I mean, we, we treated it we, we decided it was just another thing that people consumed and that they'd be better off if we deregulated it. Um, and I think we didn't, we didn't really think about the long-term implications of what does this mean for reliability? What does this mean for continuity of service? What does it mean uh, for our ability to shape the grid in the way that we wanna shape it? You know, if you've, got a, if you've got a deregulated grid, what you're basically saying is, the makeup of this incredibly important system is being left to the workings of the market. Well, I, I think electricity is too important to allow the shaping of that system just to the market, right? So answer to the last question you gave, I think, you know, if I could figure out a way to put the genie back in the bottle in the places where the genie is out of the bottle, I would do it. I just don't know how to put the genie back in the bottle. And, and I don't think it's going to happen in Texas. I think that, you know, there's going to be some time passing and there's going to be a lot of pushback by the incumbents who've made a, you know, carved out a lot of business in Texas. And I, they're, I think they're going to really push back against any effort at significant regulation, including, I think, capacity markets. But, yeah. Yeah. but let me, you, you had a story that we discussed yesterday on the phone uh, about your interaction with ERCOT and, um, uh, it was a, you had a, a colleague working with you and it, uh, remind me of that, if you don't mind, if you could tell that story in short order. Sure. I, I, I had a, uh, I had a very junior colleague working with me. I was lucky enough one summer to have a uh, incredibly bright undergraduate electrical engineering student from MIT uh, do an internship with the organization that I spent a lot of time working with. And uh, I had asked her to helped me kind of understand uh, a concept that was at that time relatively new in the, in the world. I was trying to get a better handle on what are the real reliability implications of building more and more wind and more and more solar on the system because those resources don't behave like the resources that we're used to having. And from the standpoint of system frequency, from the standpoint of maintaining frequency, um, there has evolved a concept and a product called synthetic inertia. Good. I'm glad and, we went back to this because we didn't quite close out the discussion of inertia, right? But yeah, just to, a quick reminder. So the grid has, has grown around this idea, around the, the reality of having these big spinning, spinning machines that provide inertia, which I would compare to pumps, pumping electricity into the market and that that pump is has to have some force behind it and you need that force of that spinning spinning machinery to push that electricity into the into the pipes i'm going to say so yep. anyway but now we're back to inertia thank you so so the the large wind projects that that are built all over the country that that are you know populate west texas um those uh doubly fed induction generators is the is the term of art used for them their turbines vary their speed depending upon the speed of the wind as opposed to you know in a coal fire power plant or gas fire plant and you get 3600 rpm is the way it, so they generate at direct current and then they go through what's called in a power from a wind project goes through an inverter, which converts it into AC power for use on the grid. And, and this is the same with solar as well. Solar produces same with solar. AC. Yeah. And so solar and wind, their peculiarity is that they are not providing, I'm cutting to the, to the key point here, they're not providing inertia into the grid. There's no spinning mass behind wind and solar that helps that, that makes the pump, pump those electrons into the system. Yeah, and, and there is spinning mass, of course, in a, in a wind turbine, 
but it's, it's isolated from the grid by virtue of the existence of the inverter. So very clever elect electrical engineers said, well, we can create in synthetic inertia. We can effectively create a piece of hardware and associated software that a wind developer or a solar developer could add to his project that would send a signal out into the grid that would look to the grid like inertia and would allow wind and solar to contribute inertia when they were operating. And I, I had to, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm less about electronic things and more about physical things. So I had to really let my head get around that for a while before I, I at least understood that it could work. Um, and so this very talented undergraduate did a literature review for me and, and kind of came back and said, well, this is what the literature says. And she did it in about half the time that I'd allotted for the work. And she said, you know, I'm really interested in Texas. I'd like to do a study of Texas because they've got a lot of wind and they've got a small grid, relatively speaking. And I'd like to see what the reliability implications of the wind that they have are. So I said, that sounds like a great plan. Um, you know, we've got the data that we need to do that study, go off and do it. And, and how long ago was this? Oh, this was five years ago, I think. Okay. Um, and so she, you know, came back and, and, and gave me a, a, a paper, um, very densely reasoned, full of partial differential equations. And I read the paper and I said, those are interesting implications, but it's been 40 years since I did any partial differential equations. So I asked a, another colleague of mine who is more recent and better at math to go over the math just to make sure the math was right. She came back and said, yep, this math is right. So what this intern determined was that ERCOT should probably be radically changing its reserve calculations in light of all the wind it was bringing on the system. And the standard protocols for establishing reserve and other re reliability criteria probably would no longer apply. So let me give you an example of one of those criteria, Robert. We talked about the basic reserve margin, but then remember I said there were several slices of reserves underneath that. So one of the things that you wanna have on a system is called spinning reserve. And spinning reserve is basically generation that is, uh, if it's thermal, it's hot. Um, it's rotor is spinning, but it's not synchronized with the grid. And that's your first line of defense, right? That can- that's The first the first standby. The, the, that's the, the hot, first standby, hot, right? Hot and ready to go, yeah. So back in the day, back in the dark ages, we used to say spinning reserve is set to equal the largest unit that is committed to the grid at any given time. So in Texas, the largest, uh, you know, back in the day, um, sorry, I'm having a senior moment. The largest big, big coal plant east of Houston was the biggest, uh, well, biggest today, thing. We'll, we'll look at South Texas projects. Yeah. So we'll just assume 1100 megawatts or 1200 yeah, so megawatts. I was gonna say it's South Texas. So you'd wanna have, back in the old day, you'd wanna have 1200 megawatts for the eventuality of, that, that South Texas trips offline for some reason. Of the spinning reserve that's ready to, ready to go. Yeah. Well, the problem with wind, because of the huge amount of correlation and, and output, you know, you were saying, I can't remember the numbers, but I think it's, you know, you got 30,000 megawatts of wind in West Texas. Well, when that wind drops off, more or less, it all drops off at the same time. And if you're using, the old fashioned spinning reserve criterion, um, you're gonna miss what is a potentially much larger drop off in wind. And so, you know, my, my intern concluded that ERCOT needed a much more radical concept for dealing with spinning reserve and dealing with the, the potential loss of, you know, most of, most of its wind over a very short period. And, um, you know, I thought that was a very interesting study. We reached out to ERCOT to say, hey, you know, you guys probably already know this, but we thought you'd be interested to see this, this study. Uh, we never 
never heard back from ERCOT. <laughs> So let me, we've been talking, we're getting closer to an hour here, Steve, and I want, I don't want to take much more than an hour or, or maybe even stop before we get to an hour. But as you know, there have been a number of studies, a large number. I mean, I don't know that it's full dozen, but it's at least a half dozen studies that have come out in recent weeks, months, and even maybe a couple of years, Stanford, MIT, Princeton, Cal Berkeley, you know, some of the most prestigious universities in America have produced studies that say, well, we could just go to 100% renewables. And, and all we need is this is and this is the question that I, I want to ask, they all uh, nearly all assume one massive amounts of generation capacity that would be two, three, four times as or five times as much capacity as we have now in the US, we have about one terawatt, 1000 gigawatts, 1.2 terawatts, something like that, 1200 gigawatts of installed generation capacity in the United States. They're assuming that we would have three, four, five terawatts of capacity. Okay, well, so, all right, we can maybe build all that stuff. But the, the key tripping point, it seems to me, the key, the key problem is that they all assume massive amounts of high voltage transmission capacity will be built in very short order to make that happen. Is it reasonable to assume, as many of these studies have done in recent in recent months, and one in particular from Princeton, assumes that we'll see a doubling, tripling of high voltage transmission? Is that realistic? No, it's not. I mean, and, and again, I mean, these 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 studies are are studies that say, you know, we've we've done the math, we've devised a scenario that is highly reliant on variable renewables. I don't know that I don't know that Princeton was you're specifically referring to Princeton. I don't think they zeroed in on a hundred percent renewable scenario, but they've got a high contribution from variable renewables in all their in all their scenarios. And and, and the goal um, was okay, so fair enough, fair fair point. The, their point is that oh if we put enough resources we get to net zero. We will have zero emissions from our energy sector yeah. if we follow this path and a lot of it's renewables. Okay, fair enough. Please go ahead. Yeah. So you know, and again, there there have been some studies done that were just bad, right? Studies that got the math wrong, where there were kind of bonehead assumptions that that and 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 inappropriate calculations. And I'm going to say this was Mark Jacobson's study, the one he did with with a, a man named Delucci from Cal Berkeley. It was debunked in the in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Mark Jacobson, to his eternal discredit, sued for defamation. Chris Clack in federal court in Washington, D.C. for a million dollars, or I forgot the exact number, and later withdrew the lawsuit and then had to pay uh, legal fees in the case exceeding $600,000. So I'm just going to call it out because it's a, it, it is a black mark forever on the, the reputation of that particular uh, uh, academic, and I think it's a black mark on his institution, but I digress. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, you know, the Princeton study and some of these other studies, I'm familiar with all of them. I've done studies like that myself, as you know, Robert. Um, they don't suffer from the same kind of defects that um, uh, Jacobson's work did. Um, they are indicative of something that is at least feasible or possible from an engineering standpoint. But that's not, and that's fine. And it's, I think it maybe is the job of academics to do studies like that. Um, but that's not the end of the conversation. And in a sense, it's the beginning of the conversation. And what I would say about the, about the, the build out about the, the massive expansion of the grid, about uh, you know tripling, quadrupling, quintupling the the amount of installed capacity, and then and then one thing that never really gets um, highlighted as much, but the embedded assumptions about how much people will have to change their behavior to accommodate a grid like this. Um, what I would say is all of that suffers from uh, a, a common but not widely remarked syndrome called RDD. Have you heard of RDD? I have not. It's reality deficit disorder. <laughs> and 
one of the one of the problems with being old and grumpy, which is what I am, is uh, I and to, I can attest to that. I'm not going to argue that point. Yeah, and, and but you know, but Robert, you know that I had a job working for 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 a, an independent power company. We built power plants. We built associated transmission lines. We built associated gas lines. So I've got you know scars on my back from dealing with a public that while the public wants cost-effective, reliable electricity, doesn't want any infrastructure anywhere near it. Um, and getting anything built is very difficult. And you've, you know, you've noted this in, in a lot of the work that you've done on, on public opposition to wind around the country, but, it, but, but it's, it's fundamental to who we are. And, and people so, care about people care about where they live. They yeah, they and they're not just going to say, "Oh, sure, run over us." And that's the part that I just kind of it it staggers me sometimes when I look at these academic studies and I'm thinking, do these academics never talk to small town politicians or small town landowners or rural landowners? But so let me just ask this question. Answer, by the way, the answer to that question, Robert, is yes, they don't. <laughs> yes, they don't. Yes, they don't. Of course not. <laughs> of course not. So why would they do but, but that? What are the, and let me ask the question specifically, and then let's wrap up here in just a moment. But why, what is the difficulty? Because we've hear, we've heard now, in fact, the New York Times just a day or so ago put out a, an, an, an unsigned editorial saying they're in favor of electrify everything. And again, which has been the mantra of the climate activists in America. And I, it's one of the things that I wrote about in Forbes that, have, you know, that I'm I'm, I'm, I'm adamantly pro-electricity like you. I've been all, you've been all over the world. I've been all over the world. I've seen poverty and deep poverty. I'm absolutely in favor of electricity, but this idea we should electrify everything is just plain madness, but it hinges on perhaps more than anything else, this idea that we can build massive amounts of high voltage transmission. So let me just put that question to you again. What are the key obstacles to building, to doubling, tripling, quadrupling the amount of high voltage transmission in the United States? What are the key obstacles? Yeah, well, the first is the public hates it. Um, nothing the public hates more than transmission um, and made more difficult in the United States by the fact that we have a very uh, fractured system for approving any kind of large infrastructure like that, you know, and, and so we always think people, people always, you know, it's, it's fashionable to talk about, we need to talk about permitting reform, right? Well, you can talk about it in Washington all you want, but if you think the public at the state level, at the county level, in at little, the local in, level, in Little Rock and Des Moines and Joplin are, and Springfield, are, and are going to cede their ability to weigh in on this sort of stuff to some kind of federal czar, you got another thing coming. I think we will always have a fractured system because the real politique of the United States says that's that's who we are. So I'm very skeptical about the ability of, of building tons and tons of new transmission. Public opposition is an obstacle. Cost is an obstacle. Uh, and, it's, and, and really overall, you know, transmission is a small cost of the, of the system, but everything always gets boiled down to the individual project. And these individual projects always have big numbers. So, um, you know, I don't think, I don't think it likely that that you know we can build the transmission of the of the sort that is envisioned in a lot of these studies. And in fact, one of the things that I've been saying on these studies is, if we really want to have a serious look at changing the carbon footprint of the system, let's do a study of what can be done by only using existing sites for new generation and existing transmission lines. Because we have a lot of we got a lot of power plant sites around the country that are that are that are uh, have been retired, that are closed down. Where you know if you want to build a new power plant, that's a pretty good place to look for it. Well, look, that's a great, and that's a great point. And so let me let me just follow up on that, and maybe we'll close out after this one because this is the other part of this that it seems to me. When we were in Lebanon, we interviewed a guy at, at E24, and his name, oh gosh, I, I, well, you were, you had a senior moment. I'm, I'm trying to remember his name just off the top of my head. But anyway, he gave us a quote on, on camera. He said, the, the amount of infrastructure in, a, in every given country is essentially fixed. Mm -hmm. And I've thought about that quite a lot since then. And so, but to, take, to get it back to this transmission point, 
that yeah if we're if the amount of high voltage transmission capacity that we have in the united states is fixed it goes to your point then we should then the opportunity means putting new power plants where old power plants were and if that's the case well they have to have small footprints and to me that just screams one only one and only one answer if we're serious about decarbonization and that is put nuclear plants where the old coal plants were is, yeah. is that it, does that make sense to you? Well, again, it makes more sense to me than trying to build lots and lots of transmission. Now, uh, on uh, on the other hand, you know, there's a lot of obstacles that nuclear has to has to hop hop through to to gain the kind of public acceptance sure. that we need to that it would need to get. But I I do I do personally think that um, especially some of the new uh, advanced nuclear technologies are are uh, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic that they might at some point uh, become some of the charismatic megafauna of the energy ecosystem. They're certainly not today. There's, there's you know, and, and you got to be realistic about that. There's the, the, the level of public opposition and, and kind of deeply embedded mistrust of nuclear is, is a huge obstacle. So last question then, and I know I said I was going to wrap it up. So what, what do you say to people who say we should electrify everything? Well, I say, first of all, there are things that are just absolutely recalcitrant to electrification. So let's be realistic about that. And, and what are those? Um, cement, for example. Um, you know, I assume we're going to continue to live in a world that is going to want cement for a while. Um, very hard to uh, electrify the cement making process. Um, transportation? Uh, um, transportation, you know. Elements of the transportation system are, 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 are highly electrifiable, you know, local short distance kind of stuff. And, and you know, from a standpoint of uh, light duty vehicles, the cars we drive, that's, that's a huge chunk of our miles traveled. But, you know, probably not a great solution for over the road semis, probably not a great solution for, for uh, uh, ocean, ocean, going, ocean going ocean vessels, vessels yeah. and things of that sort. Um, but but again, the other the other the, the the other thing that's worth thinking about is just because a particular end use may be amenable to electrification doesn't mean in the long run that we're going to wind up electrifying it. So we've got a lot of studies out there, a lot of you know sort of deep technical analysis of, of where where could we do electrification. Well, one of the things we know about technical potential studies is. Um, we never achieve, we never capture the entire technical potential, right? We're always going to get something less than the technical potential. There are going to be all kinds of reasons why certain sectors or certain geographies remain recalcitrant to electrification. So the, you know, the, 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 the more sober people in this debate that I uh, know, and, and I do know a few of them, um, uh, you know, recognize that there's an opportunity to increase the use of electricity and reduce emissions, assuming the electricity is coming from a zero emission source, but that there are going to be a lot of end uses where we're going to need some other solution. And that may be a carbon capture solution, that may be a zero carbon fuel solution like, like hydrogen. And I know I, I hesitate to mention hydrogen, Robert, because I know you've got strong feelings about it, but um, I'm, I'm a skeptic. <laughs> but, uh, you know, again, I, we're not going to electrify everything. Not now, not soon, probably not in my grandchildren's lifetime. Well, let's stop there, Steve. We've been on the on uh, more than an hour now, so I, it's been great. It's great to reconnect and get you on, on camera again, even though it's on Zoom. And uh, uh, but uh, this was great fun. My guest, Steve Brick, is an independent power systems consultant, and independent power industry uh consultant who's had uh, a long career in the business. He is not recommending anything. His only call to action, Steve, it's, it's to read Meredith Engwin's book. Is that right? You're, you're... You read that? It's a great book. Uh, and I, it's a book that I obviously sympathize quite deeply with, but it's, it's a good read. She, she's, she's done a good job writing on a, a kind of a geeky technical topic. Yeah, I, I agree. And she's, uh, she's getting a lot of traction with it. And I'm, I'm happy for that. 
Um, well, we'll talk again another day about natural gas use in Africa and what at that might mean in electrification efforts there, because that's an interesting area. I had uh, Todd Moss uh, from the Energy for Growth Hub on the podcast a while back who talked about some of those issues. But um, my, many thanks, Steve. Many thanks for being on the Power Hungry podcast here on Blackout Week. Pleasure, um, Stan. <laughs> Um, we're going to have, I think, one more episode of the Power Hungry podcast during Blackout Week, so don't miss that one. Um, and uh, thanks you, to you, Steve, for uh, uh, spending time with me, and thanks to all of you in podcast land. Uh, we'll see you on the next episode of the Power Hungry podcast. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve.